we're here with Nano of uh, Insomnium. Is that how we pronounce the name? Nilo. Nilo. All right. I, I did absolutely no uh, research on how that should be pronounced, and I probably should have. Don't worry. I, I, I'm used to it. People uh, announce it. Probably. Uh, it doesn't matter. As someone from, not from an English-speaking country, I'm very used to people mispronouncing my name, too. Yeah, I, I can imagine. You can. All right. Uh, but what I did instead is that I have read both Wittner's Gate and Arno 1696, uh, so which which is why I specifically wanted to do the interview with you because uh, now I can interview you both as a musician and as a writer. Very cool. I'm happy with this plan. Mm -hmm. So I specifically want to talk about the past couple of Insomnium albums from Winter's Gate onwards, because this is where it seems like the albums were getting a bit more narratively focused. Even though previously they were really uh, very, very lyrical and those lyrics had some sort of concept, it didn't seem like before Winter's Gate, uh, the entire album itself had uh, a unifying concept. Is that, uh, is that so? You are right. Like our second album, uh, it had sort of theme. I don't know if, if it's kind of a maybe hidden there, but it's kind of kind of concept album, but it's maybe a bit vague <laughs> in a way. But you are right that Winter's Gate was strictly a concept album, one story that I wrote, but also Hot and Grave. We had this concept of kind of paying tribute to these old Finnish kind of stories and songs and kind of the most, the saddest songs in Finland. It was kind of the theme. And now with Anno 1696, again, it's my short story. So it's one clear, clear concept, clear theme. So you are right. And like, I'm happy with this progression. Now I can <laughs> fulfill all my passions with this band. I, I can write. Mm -hmm. write stories and, and do music so i find this very cool right because i know 1696 uh, was also a much more expansive story than winter's gate was it, i think it was about twice as long yeah uh, also uh in both of these stories you uh you were approaching them as very short chapters from the point of view of one of the characters uh why was that your preferred way of writing Make that kind of a. Uh, I've read, have been influenced by book, books that are done like that, and I personally like it. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I like the way that a story is being told from multiple perspectives. So like, there's always more than two sides to every story, and that's a good way of showing that. And the people see things very differently, experience them differently, and it's also. As a narrative tool, it's a like good way of kind of revealing information, like in a good way, like not too much too early, keeping the secrets there, and then the other one tells a different story. And uh, I like to, I like to use that kind of narration technique. Yeah, in both in both of these stories, uh, there is something that's going on uh, and that's slowly revealed to the reader and it would be if it was an objective story and right from the start you would say Lillian something or this is what's happening on the island yeah kind of ruin a bit of the suspense of trying to figure out okay what exactly is happening here yes yeah that's the point it's kind of a well both of these are a bit like detective stories that there is a mystery and of course you have to Keep it hidden as long as possible, and only in the end you kind of give the full explanation. And even then, you it's better not to explain things like too much, like right. leave as much to the imagination of the of the of the reader as possible. Right. And is uh, is this something uh, that you have used for separate songs on other albums, uh, without necessarily going into a big story like you did for these albums? Well, usually, if it's not a concept album, then every story is its usually from the perspective of one person who tells it. Like, and same also here in all the songs of Anno 1696, it's always one song is kind of from one perspective. 
So I, I find it like more coherent and kind of, well, it's easier also for the listener or the reader that one song, you don't have perspective changes within this one song. Mm -hmm. But of course, next song usually is from different perspectives. So that's kind of how I see it. Like one song is almost like one chapter, right. even though it might tell a, a bit longer tale than ac actually in this short story, what the one chapter is. But uh, like, I don't want to focus the na na narrative perspective within one song. Right, right. But I'm asking, outside of these two uh, very narrative albums, do you feel there's any Insomnium song which has this slow revealing of information from the perspective where you can leave something to the imagination of, as to what's happening there? Yes, and like my my lyrics are usually kind of, sto they are stories. Mm -hmm. They are always stories and there is some something is happening. It's just not that you are just like... Uh, telling uh, a certain mood or something. It is always a story and there is some kind of ending, some kind of revelation in the end. Like uh, if we take the Conjurer from the Arch and Moon EP, like first it's, it starts as kind of, you think it's a love song. Mm -hmm. And it is, but in the end you realize that the, the narrator is kind of lost his mind and and, and taking the stars from the sky and like darken the world because he's so jealous. Like he has gone insane actually, but it's revealed only in the very end. So yeah, that's how I like to write lyrics and stories. So the listener can get much more out of the experience by realizing that these lyrics are sung uh, by a narrator, a character in, within a certain world. Yes, yes. And, uh, and there, if there is an element of surprise in the lyrics, then then it's a job well done. Mm -hmm. Like that it's not just some standard heavy metal lyrics, but there is actually a story and some, some something to think about. That's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so you were mentioning that Heart Like a Grave is also has some sort of conceptual thread with sad Finnish songs holding a basis. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, like uh, I was fascinated by this um, in the biggest newspaper of Finland uh, like some five years ago or something. They had this kind of competition or voting. People could vote what is the saddest song in Finland, most depressing, saddest song. It was really interesting to see the results. And the top 10 was really, yeah, they are so sad. <laughs> but all of them are kind of really popular songs, like that everybody knows. But when you think about them and you see the list, that they, yeah, we have some re very dark songs. And even like Christmas, the most popular Christmas songs can be really dark. Mm -hmm. Like that a girl is crying in the church because like her little brother is dead and and little brother appears as a as a sparrow in the graveyard and we sing that kind of songs in the christmas and that's very like finnish so heart like a grave album was kind of exploring that idea and those themes that are found in these most bleakest saddest finnish songs and uh and like for example and bells they toll that is kind of based on the the, the number one <laughs> Saddest song on the list, uh, which is kind of tells this story of this w woman who like lives in, in extreme poverty on some small hut in a swamp, and kind of only there are so, like brief moments of happiness when when she was young. She remembers like something something positive happened, but uh, she got married, but then, but then the husband died, and she spent just whole whole life in, in misery and poverty and that's the whole that's the song originally and well and it was it's very dark stuff and uh and bells they told this kind of adaptation of that like i wrote something extra to make it a bit longer and kind of expand the idea and story make it more like insomnia but like the basic idea is the same that in that that old song right all right so anno 1969 uh, 1696 uh, very clearly puts it in a historical era uh, but is uh, 
is there a very clear year uh, or setting for uh, Winter's Gate? No, it's it's on purpose a bit vague. Of course, it's Viking era. Mm. I think it's uh, like year eight hundred or something, mm -hmm. but it's not actually said said there. So, at the point when when the <laughs> Vikings were raiding raiding Irish coasts, so uh, but it's it's left like a bit vague that what is the year exactly. Right. All right. So for. Uh... Uh, the new story, uh, because getting the year again would be a bit too. Uh, this is right before the Great Northern War. Uh, can you tell us a bit of what the situation in Sweden was like at the time? Yeah, well, look, seventeenth century is very interesting and and very dark era. Like one of my favorite periods in history. There are a lot of cool, well, cool, very dark and dramatic stuff. There, there are a lot of wars in Europe. Uh, science is rising, it's fighting with religion, witch hunts are going on, and already in like 1690s, uh, like enlightenment and science were rising so that in the most like educated countries, well, in Germany, France, England, they were not burning witches anymore. Mm -hmm. But in the north, that was back then like uh, the backwaters of Europe. Uh, in Swedish Empire were really poor, poor and, and backwards place, and here we were still burning witches, beheading beheading witches in in that period. And specifically, this year is chosen because it's the like the biggest hunger catastrophe in Finland was 1696 and 97. Like one third of the population died of hunger because it was so cold that all the harvest was lost. And like there was nothing to eat, and in those days, like society couldn't cope with that kind of situation. Like there was nothing that could be done. Like during the winter, all the, all the seas were frozen. There was no way to get transport food to another corner of the empire. Like it, if there would have been any food, it would have been impossible to get it to another place. So the kind of the society in Finland collapsed basically, and like like one third of people died in a couple of years. So it's the biggest catastrophe in Finnish history, even before the the Northern War starts. And uh, at that time, of course, Sweden was kind of uh, a major power in 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 Europe. Yeah, the Swedish Empire was like most of the Scandinavia and also Poland, some parts in Germany, Denmark, at some point, like Sweden was a big, well, not the Denmark, Denmark was also a competitor, but big parts in Poland and, and Finland and Baltic states, they were, they were Swedish. And of course, main competitor was Russia. And Sweden and Russia have been warring or had been warring for like, Many hundreds of years, and Finland has always been in the middle in the history, and actually div divided by these wars, and the, and the border has been changing in in, in centuries, and especially here in the well, I live in the east eastern part of Finland. There are these different borders <laughs> and and years that we can actually see that okay, this river was the border in the 17th century, but this another river here was the border on the next century, and. So that, that was the situation uh, in, in that era. Like Swe Sweden was a major, major power in, in Europe. But after the Great Northern War, it kind of lost that status like for good. Sweden tried to invade those areas back, uh, but like eventually Russia, Russia, then even got Finland in like 1808. And, and Sweden lost the Finland to Russia, but then okay, so it uh, would, we have been independent. It would be some. even more a hundred years after the story that Finland actually got conquered. Yes, yes. But like during, there was times when actually the Ru Russians conquered Finland for a brief period of time. But then when the peace was made, the, uh, Sweden got it back. But like 1808, 1809, that was the war in the Napoleonic era when uh, Russia actually got Finland 
mm -hmm. from Sweden. <clears throat> right. So, um, how was the life of a Finnish person under the Swedish Empire? Like, um, well, Sweden and Finland, they, they, it was a poor country back then. Like, uh, like compared to Germany or, or France or, or England, uh, kind of a back back backwards of Europe back in the day. So it, it's been a long, long way, only after the Second World War, that Scandinavia has kind of risen to be this kind of welfare state as it is or has been now for, for, for some time. But back then it was really a poor place. Like, of course, like everywhere in Europe, a normal average person was working every day to get, get the food, get something to eat. Uh, but like, it wasn't like uh, that the Sweden would have oppressed Finland. I, it wasn't like that. There was not yet this Finnish kind of national com nationalism was not a thing in those days. There was not a Finnish kind of the Finns were not they didn't want the freedom yet. Let's put it this way. I think most of the people thought, okay, we're we're part of Sweden and that's cool and and we had the own language. And normal people, like average people, talk Finnish, and then the aristocratic class was the Swedish Swedish talking. So uh, that was Finland was the uh, language of the common people. That's the difference, and all all the priests, uh, priests and and officers and more educated people they talk Swedish. Right. So there was a division not only on ethnic lines but on class lines because the higher classes were the Swedish nobles. Yes, yes, and, there was. Mm -hmm. But among these, the nobility in Finland, uh, could the Finns rise to nobility? Well, in those days, like if you came from, some, uh, it's the same thing every, everywhere in Europe. If you were born to be a peasant, it was extremely difficult to have this social rise. Mm -hmm. Like probably if you if you went to the army, that was probably, or if you got into kind of priest school, you could kind of become something else than what you were born to be. But uh also, these Swedish-speaking families, I think they most of them still felt like they are Finnish, like they had been there already for like very long time, and they they were living in Finland and for for centuries. And Sweden was the language, a Swedish was the language for them, but like a, they were still Finnish, and and there was like a distinction between the Swedes that were living in what Sweden is now, and then what on the other side of the Gulf in, in Finland, which was not called Finland back then, it was like the East, East land, in Swedish, actually, the name of the place. So, what kind of this Finnish national identity was born in the 19th century uh, with Kalevala epic and, and uh, all that stuff. And so, yeah, a lot of national identities really started taking root in the 19th century uh, that happened yes. in Estonia as well which is where i'm from you can see that happening with other countries like estonia or whatever yes mm. exactly and that's the rise of nationalism like all over europe and of course that led to many wars <laughs> of course right like smaller nations could get independence as well so it was a big change of course and Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So uh, the story happens right on the very last few years of the reign of Charles the Eleventh, and uh, I I see that the king was mentioned as being weak by one of the characters. Yes. Uh, is that is that very relevant, or is that just the perspective of one character? It, it's true. Like he died of some kind of stomach tumor. Well, how back then, of course, they didn't know what it was, but he, he had severe stomach pains. And I think a couple of last years of the reign were kind of difficult, but he was really sick and he couldn't really do anything. So it kind of affects the mood. It's part of the kind of the overall atmosphere. 
because in in those years there was this kind of waiting for the kind of doom and gloom atmosphere the people actually were afraid that the, the world is ending this kind of apocalyptic mentality which i'm also trying to kind of tell in this story that uh there were these like extremely cold years that are also mentioned in the story that there was actually a lot of snow in Rome, for example, in, in southern France, people were freezing to death. And like in Esto uh, Estonia, Iceland, <laughs> Iceland, like uh, during the whole whole summer, it was still like snow on the ground. So really cold years. And part of it was that some of the volcanoes in Iceland and also actually on the other side of the world in Asia, there were these big volcano eruptions that affected the climate for Mm -hmm. So this for several years, I... and we know that now. But of course, back then people didn't realize that why is it so cold suddenly. So there was this like it's it is the end of the world or what what's going on? This kind of mentality. Yeah, especially when these were not man-made events like uh, the invasion yeah. of another country. This 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 was something by nature. Of course, they of course with, uh, supernatural elements to it. Yes, the wrath of God or the end of the world that. The world is freezing. What what is going on? People, of course, they, they didn't understand. Right, and especially they were looking for something to blame. Of course, the witches. <laughs> the witches, naturally. Yes, naturally. All right. Uh, so, do you think Lillian acted in self defense? Well, I, I don't want to spoil the story, but uh, but. Uh, Yes, and of course, the main theme is that she would do anything for for her children, mm -hmm. for her for her child. That's the, that's the main theme of the story. Right. So, yes. And this uh this thing about uh, love between worlds that is not possible is is something that's a tale as old as time. Did you use any other tales as inspiration for this one? Yes. Uh, main one of the main inspirations is this Finnish novel by Aino Kallas. Mm -hmm. It's Hide Morsian in Finnish. It's Bride of the Wolf or Wolf's Bride in English. It's said, uh, it's like considered as one of the best Finnish novels of all time. It's a classic. I really love it. And it's actually set in 17th century Estonia, in Hiuma Island on, on the Baltic Sea. The Baltic sea. And it, it is this werewolf, werewolf wolf story. And it's it's a very kind of unique, it's hard to describe because it's written in such an archaic like language that it sounds like it's actually written in, in the 17th century, but it's written like about 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. But a, re a really cool, very, very dark and kind of this tragic ballad uh, about this woman that hears this call of this from the woods and then she becomes a werewolf herself and uh, of course she's already married and uh, the, the the husband doesn't understand what's going on and uh, well it's a tragic tale but uh it's one of really my favorite favorite stories and i wanted to kind of capture the same kind of atmosphere and food and, and mood and kind of write a sequel or kind of tribute to that story. So actually this is this is happening 30 years after that. So we can think if we want that the mother wolf that appears in 1696 would actually be same character as main character in this Aino Gallas story. It's not said there, but I think she is the same character. Yeah, we can. She got away. It's kind of the alternative version, but if she would have escaped and and came to Finland, what would have happened? It's kind of this kind of mind mind game. Yeah, you you can use that as your head cannon. Yeah. Right. And now, uh, how different is it approaching uh, using narrative inside the story as the book, and how different is it writing the same story in lyrics for the song? It's different. Uh, yeah, I can tell. 
like we we just get and with with an O sixteen ninety six there was first the story and then we wrote music that would fit the atmosphere and mood of the story. In both cases, it, it became quite dark and kind of blackened. So compared to Heart Like a Grave, it's it's a bit different. So I think we just get and I know 1696 are closer to each other than, than Heart Like a Grave. Music became very, very dark, dark and, and harsh, cold. And uh, then at some point when you have the album structure, you have the song sequence, then you can start to think that how you actually write the lyrics so that it works and and people would understand it even without reading the short story. I know everybody's not going to read it, of course, uh, but still the story has to make sense so that you just read the lyrics so you would at least get the basic idea. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you have to condense a lot of the story, basically an entire chapter, in very in a few lyrics that also need to have a chorus. Yes, so uh, they are different <laughs> kind of forms of art. Because, yeah, lyrics are poetry, and 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 uh, short stories prose. So you have to make decisions that what kind of bits and pieces you can actually. From the short story, you should tell in the lyrics that tell enough, but like don't tell too much. So it's kind of balancing that what you want to tell. But also, the uh, the lyrics in a short story work like this. So they like complement each other and tell something from the different perspectives. Like the song "The Unrest," which is the kind of ballad song on the album, it is actually something that is not being told in the short story. It's kind of this extra scene where we see that Yuho, this husband, when, when he, he starts to realize that there's something going on with her wife and she, he doesn't know yet what it is. This, it's about that moment that he kind of is afraid that is, is he going to lose her wife now, uh, his wife, or what's what's going on? Why is the... Why is the wife watching the forest <laughs> and, and acting strange? It's kind of, it's an extra scene, kind of what 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 is being left out from the short story. So together, if you read the lyrics and the short story, it, it comes together and gives kind of. It's different than just reading the lyrics or just reading the short story. All right, and uh, speaking of leftovers, you're also releasing this alongside an EP for certain editions of the album, right? Not leftovers. We had 11 unique <laughs> songs. Yeah, to be honest, like when we went to studio, we thought, okay, we have 11 songs. Let's let's record these. Uh, and then we realized it's 75 minutes of music, and it's it's gonna be too much uh, for anyone. To digest on one take so we thought okay let's do it like this we have eight tracks like something like 55 minutes the standard version and then these other three tech tracks they are they're better than just bonus tracks that's what i honestly feel and like some of some of the very good songs were left there mm. it deserve they deserve something better than bonus tracks so they are songs of the dusk ep and uh they will be on the artbook version. And let's see later what I, I think we'll find some other use for them as well. So I honestly think they are, we could have picked some other three songs as well. It was, we had to vote in the end that which songs we're going to leave out. And it was a kind of tight, tight discussion. Uh, I think they are very good songs and they deserve. I'm, I'm quite sure in some of the fans will we'll like them a lot. Right. I don't think a 75 minutes album is really that out of reach. It can be done, but you, you also have to think that even with all the effort that you've put into the story of the album, a lot of people will just listen to the album as an album. They will just yeah. the, the album experience, just the music, whatever. Yeah, 75 minutes, would, like it, it wouldn't be impossible and uh, like many, many people would have been fine fine with it. But still, like, 
I think it's better to leave people a bit hungry than overdo it and have it have it too much. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, fifty-five it's, minutes is a good good length. A, a lot more bands should should know this ability to self-edit themselves. Yes, yes, and in, in hindsight, some of our older albums we could have left one or two songs as bonus tracks, and it would have been maybe a better decision. But hey, we're artists, and we are loving our own, own stuff so it's always hard to leave it leave your songs out so right and these songs that will be on the ap will these be ever available separately physically let's see but i think that in some form they will be available but for now they will be on the artbook version but i'm quite sure we will invent something that in some point in the future they will be available in in other forms as well yeah, like they, they deserve it because if if you're if you're going to name this as an EP, uh, they kind of deserve like a, a separate cover art or anything to yes. kind of distinguish them from just being a CD two. Yes, and I I think that's the idea, and but uh, we'll get to it later. Uh, first, we release this, and then maybe it will be kind of kind of extra EP between albums or something with. I hope we can do like new cover for it and more illustrations and let's see, but like something cool that those who really, really are in some new fans, they something that they would really appreciate. And so, yeah, let's see. Right. Uh, so is there anything else you'd like to add? Because we're nearing the, the end of the 30 minutes. I, mean, I think I've been talking more in this interview than in, in many others combined. But yeah, um, what should I say? Yeah, I'm looking forward that everybody can soon hear the album. And uh, it's been ready now for, for a couple of months and just waiting that mm. all people can uh, hear the songs and let's see the feedback and of course, we want to get to touring, touring again. And uh, in the last couple of years, there hasn't been much touring, of course. And uh, that's that's something that we look forward to. Make a proper European tour, for example. Right. And last question. Uh, let's suppose you're going to do another album with another story. If you could get any living director to direct the entire story as a movie, who would it be? It would uh, maybe Mr. Villeneuve, who's done oh, Dune right. now, for example, like and this Blade Runner sequel. All right. He would be the one. That he, I really like them both, and the way all all the stuff he has done, they look amazing, and the soundtracks are very good. And I have like those are maybe my two favorite mu movies from past five years have been. Dune and Blade Runner 2049. Right. Yeah. Right. Very good. Well, okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. It was a, my pleasure. My pleasure as well. Bye. Okay. Bye bye.